Nala Kravich's Outback Quest was very plainly to find a homeland for the threatened Jews of Europe. He had been to Germany in 1933 and he'd seen what happened after Hitler's rise to power and he was completely prescient. He could see what was coming and he told every Jew he met that they ought to leave Europe, that they were destined for extinction. And uh, he was already a traveller by the time he came to Australia um, in 1933. And he'd seen that the world, as he put it, was full of empty spaces and all the Jews were in need of these empty spaces. So he got himself sent to Australia. The pretext was that he was fundraising for the Yiddish school system in Poland, and having learned that there was a Yiddish-speaking community in Melbourne, um, already the establishment of the Kadima was years and years old. It had been established in 1911. Uh, he came here ostensibly to raise money, but really uh, he wanted to have a look at Australia's empty spaces. So he went around Australia raising money, as he was supposed to do, giving lectures. He was enormously fated. He was a rock star on the international Yiddish literary scene. Um, and then entirely on his own initiative and pretty well entirely alone, he set out on this extraordinary, courageous, bold, crazy outback quest. He took the train to Alice Springs and then he, Springs is the <laughs> operative word in this journey because from Alice Springs to Burdham, which was a journey of 800 miles across the Australian desert, there was no road. You'll eventually see pictures of this extraordinary terrain from some of the most inhospitable landscapes in the world. And he hitched a ride in a mail truck with an Italian mailman and a 16-year-old Aboriginal assistant to the mailman. And the springs were coming through the seat of the truck. It had no doors. He had to hang on to the windscreen to stop himself from falling out. 800 miles of this, a thousand, over a thousand kilometres. And then from Burdham, again, in a train, which sounded as though it was also open because he arrived in Darwin, covered in red dust and mosquito bites. And in Darwin, somehow he'd managed to get himself an interview with the Northern Territory administrator who, frightened of the possibility of the yellow peril, even back then, coming down to occupy Australia's empty spaces, agreed that whatever else you might say about Jews, they were white. And so <laughs> he thought that, yes, um, perhaps a million Jews could help to settle the perilously, perilously empty spaces of the Northern Territory. So that was Nalaf Ravitch's Outback Quest. It was an extraordinary journey. And he took, he was a bit of an amateur photographer. He had a friend who, who was a photographer and I think must have taught him a bit about photography. And although he had a primitive little box brownie Kodak camera, he took 90 quite fascinating, wonderful photographs on this journey. And in 1991, when I was editing a journal for Multicultural Arts Victoria, someone wrote me an article about Malak Ravitch's journey. I had never heard of him before this. And with this article was printed one of those photographs. And it was a really eccentric, evocative photograph um, that showed a lot of what the man was. He was standing, uh, leaning against the corrugated iron wall in the company of an, as he put it, aristocratic looking, tall, slim, young Aboriginal woman whom he said was the 
uh, most beautiful woman in Darwin. So she was smoking a pipe and he had his kangaroo skin trousers hitched up nearly to his armpits, a white shirt and a bow tie. And so this is the photograph that set my imagination going and I thought I really want to tell this story and I want uh, and I then found that <clears throat> miracle of miracles the 90 photographs that he took in 1933 were extant they still existed in Melbourne in the care of Ben Morris and David Burston, because their father, the Yiddishist and the Bundist, Sender Burston, had been instrumental in bringing Ralikrovich to Australia. <clears throat> and when when um, Ravitch left Australia at the end of his outback journey in 1933, or perhaps he left in 34, the beginning of 34, he left the album with the Burstons and the three boys were its custodians and they lent it to me so i that's that's what inspired me to produce the book and then i found that not only did i have these 90 marvelous photographs which showed how crazy and bold and courageous this journey had been but um his son, Melif Ravitch's son, who was the famous artist Jossel Bergner, had based a series of paintings on his father's photographs. And so this was another marvellous opportunity. I could tell the story and I could illustrate it with the photographs and with the paintings done by Jossel Bergner. And I, but my other big mission, because I'm a modern Australian, was to set this story against the backdrop of the worldwide refugee problem. Because Melif Ravitch, although his son thought he was a fantasist and a dreamer, seems to me to have had a profound understanding of refugee reality. And the fact that there are empty spaces in Australia is still true. And it's not necessary for us to torture and imprison refugees when they could, as in fact the Jews ended up doing, become model citizens of Australia. Well, because he was that way. <laughs> um, Ravitch was a very complicated character and his actions and his poetry and his statements were full of paradoxes. He was arrogant. Um, a lot of the book, well, let me say, two chapters of the book are written by Ravitch himself. Um, by the time Ravitch was 46, he had visited 44 countries and determined never to travel again. That's when he settled in Montreal in Canada in 1941. Two of the chapters in the book are actually written by Malik Ravitch. Ravitch had been an inveterate traveller, so he travelled all of those countries and as he travelled, he wrote and he wrote and he wrote. He wrote all kinds of things. He wrote prose, travel writing, travelogues. He wrote poetry. His, he produced a book called Oceans and Continents, which was a poetic atlas, really, of those 44 countries. He produced essays and while he was in Australia and he travelled to all the mainland capital cities, he never got to Tasmania, as well as the outback and all the time he was here he was sending back articles to a newspaper in Warsaw called the Naya Volkszeitung, a Yiddish newspaper. He was a Yiddishist and he was a Yiddish poet. He wrote in Yiddish all the time. And for him, Yiddish was his homeland. It was the universal Esperanto of his people. 
So from those writings, and they were put together by an editor in 1937 under the title of Across Australia, and very little of Malofrovich's Yiddish writing has been translated, unfortunately. I'm actually trying to get the Yiddish Book Centre in Massachusetts interested in taking him on as a project and translating at least that amazing poetic atlas, Oceans and Continents. But a little bit of his Australian writings were translated and what has been translated, I've edited and produced in two chapters of the book. And his arrogance certainly shows in that. And like a lot of travellers, I think the less time you spend in a place, the more inclined you are to make outrageous generalisations. And that's what Ravage did. He did make amazing generalisations about the Australian, he called it. And uh, he writes about the Australian as though it's an exotic species of fauna. And he makes some outrageous statements about the Australian, who is the European Australian. But he also, to counter that arrogance, he writes with deep sympathy about the Aboriginal population, and he is very far-sighted in what he can see has happened to them, and he sees a parallel, as did his son, Jossel Bergner, between the impending threat of genocide of both the Eastern European Jews and the Australian Aborigines. He can see that, and, and he's done some research and he understands that they used to have complex tribal customs and very strict laws according to which they lived. And into this was thrown the terrible invasion of the Europeans and all of their customs and their laws have been abandoned and that has led to their degradation. He can see all that. And he actually took the trouble to learn Aboriginal words, which is more than most Australians of any era, including ours, which is supposed to be more enlightened, have ever done. We know more about American Indian parlance than we do about Australian Aboriginal parlance. So he did see all that. And he was horrified by the reservations. He was horrified by what he saw in the Sydney Museum of a skeleton of a gorilla put next to the skeleton of a, an Australian Aboriginal. And he thought that that lifted the curtain on Australia's ghastly treatment of the Aborigines. But he was a self-interested Jewish seeker after a safe haven for Jews. And he was also able to write that the Aborigines cannot be considered as the owners of the land because they are on the lowest rung of civilization. And my publishers had terrible trouble writing these things because this is what he wrote. He wrote many contradictory and paradoxical things. Um, but he was a man of his time, and not just his time, because his attitudes are not uncommon today. So he did incorporate all of these complex, paradoxical elements in his character. There was, there was another incident that he recorded when he was offered the services of young Aboriginal women for money, of course, and he saw that for exactly what it was. It was desperation, degradation, the loss of all their dignified traditions. He was horrified by that. Not at all in the beginning, because when I first 
decided to write the story, um, I knew very little about Jossel Bergner. I, I knew that he'd done those paintings and the paintings are called Melech Ravitch in the Kimberleys. No, there, there are many myths around on the internet and they perpetuate each other and they tell the story that both Bergner and Ravitch went to the Kimberley. Neither of them ever went to the Kimberley. Um, Ravitch went to Darwin, no, he never went further west than that. And as far as I know, Bergner didn't leave Victoria. Um, but when I was doing the research for the book, I loved the paintings and I had watched a documentary on Jossel Bergner called Painting the Town. And when I began all of my researches, I got in touch with Jossel Bergner, who lived in Australia for 11 years. Although Ravitch couldn't save his people, he did manage to save his family. He brought them here. And um, Bergner, his son, Ravitch was a pseudonym. That's why they have different names. Um, Bergner, his son, lived here from 1937 to 1948. And he was part of that Sydney Nolan, Albert Tucker, uh, Noel Cunahan, the Heidi group. And he was tremendously influential. Even though he was 17 when he arrived here, he was already a developed expressionist painter. When I decided I wanted to write the book, I contacted Jossel Bergner and he was extremely generous with his support, uh, with permissions for using his paintings. He was delighted that I was going to do it because his father was an obsession with him. He was the typical absent father, adored, worshipped, missed, uh, misconceived, no doubt, as absent fathers will be. And the more I got to know Jossel Bergner and the more I read about him, one of the things he did was he sent me a memoir. He sent me um, his own memoir and he also sent me the full book of Ibero Australia across Australia that his father had written in Yiddish. And the more I found out about Bergner's story, the more I realised that the two men together formed a very interesting story in their idealism and in their dream of a better world. And one illustrated the other. And it was only when I really got into it that I realised how big a part of the book Jossel Bergner would be. And in fact, um, there's a whole chapter on Bergner and his life story and his art story. And that incorporates a lot of Australian art history because he was so influential here. And then there's another chapter of his writing about his father, which throws a very intimate, personal, sometimes humorous, often cynical, often ironic view of Melech Ravitch. And so there's a lot of cross illumination in the book because Ravitch had a lot to say about Bergner as well, which is a little bit of that in the book too. I um, I live a stone's throw from uh, from Heidi, so I'll, next time I'm I'm wandering through there, I'll I'll, I'll have to have a look and see uh, which of his works they've got on show there. Well, they do have a collection of Jossel Bergner, and and because he was Bergner was taken in by Albert Tucker. They met in the Melbourne Public Library. Bergner was starving because mm. Ravitch was a terrible father. He was a terrible family man. And as soon as Bergner, he brought his family here between 35 and 37 and Bergner was the last to arrive at the age of 17. And once he arrived, Ravitch left, went traveling the world again and he left them starving. And Tucker, who met Bergner in the library, um, took him under his wing and Bergner used to go to Tucker's house for breakfast every day. 
and it was apparently the only meal <laughs> he was eating. And there is an Albert Tucker gallery at Heidi, mm. and it often has Bergner's work in it, but they do have a little collection there. Yes, <laughs> they do. Um, I'm going to quote here from a marvellous thesis I found. The research for this was a lot of fun and I loved coming across things like this. This was a thesis written in the US about Yiddish travelogues. Um, this is a quote from it. His travel writing in particular is permeated with intellectual and aesthetic curiosity, a desire to celebrate the world's cultural variety and apparent inconsistencies, and a great regard for originality. Writing travelogues allowed Revich to turn his restlessness and rootlessness into advantages by treating them as powerful symbols, both of the Jewish experience and of creativity. So his, his traveling was a, a really powerful expression of his personality. When he was a little boy, uh, his father had given him a beating and he got the key off the shelf to the door, the front door. He couldn't reach the door and he said, I want to go, I want to go, I'm running away. And his father said, but where are you going? And he said, to the world. And he did. He went to the world. And he was of that generation of secular Jews. He was, I imagine, steeped in Jewish learning, as they were those pre-war shtetl Jews. But he wanted to break out of that. And in breaking out of that, to some extent, he lost himself. And there is a theory that in all of his traveling, he was actually looking to go back home to the shtetl. And in one of his poems, his mother demolishes him by saying, do you think that there's any more out there than there is in the marketplace in the little town where you came from? We'll all end up in the cemetery anyway. So he was a traveller because he was a universalist, he was secular. He believed that all barriers eventually would disappear and that there would be no Jews or Gentiles, there'd be no national borders, all men would be brothers, excuse the gendered language, but that's what he used. He was also a terrible misogynist, I've been told. Um, and all men would eventually become vegetarians as well. And he, he was a great friend of Isaac Singer's and he apparently influenced Singer to become a vegetarian, who famously said, um, all men are Nazis where animals are concerned. I am a Yiddishist now. Um, after I decided I wanted to write the book, I didn't know a lot about the philosophical underpinnings of Yiddish. It was a language I grew up with, but I grew up in a Zionist family who discounted Yiddish as a mere vehicle. And like the rest of the Jewish world, my family bowed down to the Zionist idea of Hebrew as superior to Yiddish. And when I discovered Ravitch, I decided that I wanted to read him in the original and I embarked on a fairly serious study of Yiddish. And eventually I did an exhibition when I was a curator at the Jewish Museum called Mamaloshin, How Yiddish Made a Home in Melbourne. And my research committee was the most inspiring group of people I've ever met. And they were all Yiddishists. Some of them 
native speakers, which meant they were survivors. And I learned a lot from them about the homeland that is Yiddish and the enormous, rich culture that the Zionists stomped upon after the establishment of the State of Israel, most Jewish communities in the world probably started out speaking Yiddish, but eventually most Jewish day schools took up the teaching of Hebrew rather than Yiddish. And Melbourne now has the only Yiddish day school in the whole world because we do have a fairly strong Yiddish community, but it's tiny, of course. So yes, I am a Yiddishist. I believe in Yiddish as a vital Yiddish, a uh, vital Jewish language, an expression of the Jewish soul, really, the Eastern European Jewish soul. Um, so it was the other way around. <laughs>